Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on subjects such as presentation skills. And today is actually number three of a series of four podcasts in the Visible and Valued Training Series, where I am talking about how to how to spice up your presentations. For the last two episodes, I've spoken about how to be, how to use strategy to improve your chances of rising in your career, improving your career by becoming more visible and more valued. The best way to do that is presentation skills. Once you have your presentation skills, then you can, uh, then you need to write the script. That's what last week was about. This week, we're talking about once you have the script, how do you make it easy, interesting? How do you spice up your presentation so that your audience gets excited and they're ready to do what you want them to do? Have you ever seen a boring speaker? Or have you ever seen a speaker who's so nervous that they talk very fast and they never really talk positive between them. They're, they gabble, 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 and you have no idea what they're talking about. Tell me, have you ever been that speaker? I think we all have at one time or another. This is the opportunity in this podcast to talk about how you can avoid those traps, the traps that speakers all over the world fall into, and truly have an interesting presentation. Now, if you were, the reason, this is like having a cooking. Suppose you were a cook in an Italian restaurant, you could boil up some spaghetti, open a can of tomatoes, dump it on top and serve it. That would be edible, but boring. What you really want to do is spice up your presentation by adding the onions, the garlic, the herbs, maybe the shrimp, maybe something, maybe some vegetables. That's what makes your presentation interesting so that you will have people coming to you wanting to have this wonderful dish that you've prepared. This today is all about how to add the spices in the right time at the right place so that you become more interesting. My intention today is to show you how not to drown your listeners in data, how to stay on track, and how to keep your audience engaged, even if you're an introvert. I encourage you to take notes. This is only going to be available for free for a short time, and then this is going to become a paid program. Also, the act of taking notes, of writing things down, is a way that you could remember things better, and so that will help you truly own this material. Just to review what we talked about last week, The formula I usually start with for a script is the classic five-point formula from Roman rhetoric. You've got introduction, talking points A, B, and C, and the conclusion with the call to action. Those are the basics. And of course, you want to reverse engineer your speech. You want to start at the end with what is your call to action? What do you want them to actually do once they've heard you, once they're all excited about what you have to say, and then work backwards for there so that the whole speech is aimed at the end. 
Now, when I do this, when I work with my clients, I tend to have speaker keys that increase audience engagement. There are 17 of them. You don't have to do all of them all at once. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the three or four of the main ones. And if you're interested in getting the whole list of 17, you can contact me afterwards. I'll tell you how at the end of the program. Why does it matter? Why do we care? Why is it important to be seen and, uh, and to really make the effort? Well, the reason is you've got to be interesting. If you're not interesting, your audience is going to tune out. They're going to do something else, especially nowadays when so much of what we do is virtual. It's really easy for someone to shrink your face and your recording, your, your broadcast into a corner of the screen and then go off and do something more fun. You've got to get people engaged in order to have them actually do what you want them to do. Get the result that you want. Does this look familiar? Have you ever been the presenter watching your audience fall asleep? It's happened to everybody, but it doesn't have to happen to you. The first thing is, how do you manage to avoid drowning people in data? What happens, the problem that so many people fall into is they do too much how, not enough why. Too much of talking about how to do what we do and not enough why it matters, why we should care. What are the benefits? What's in it for me? It's the old with me acronym. What's in it for me? Tell them about the benefits are. If Even if you have to give a presentation where you're talking about what they need to do, Tell them why it matters. This happened to my client, Gregory. Gregory is an employment lawyer, and uh, he's, he's really good at the details. He doesn't work with clients as much as working with charts and graphs. He loves doing all of that stuff. He loves following all the regulations. Well, because he was so good at understanding all the regulations, his boss said, Gregory, we need you to be the one to tell our clients about these new federal regulations that have come in and what they need to do. And he called me up. He said, I don't want to have to do that. I don't like to be out there talking to people. Uh, and I know they're going to hate it. These regulations are so boring. They're important, but they're boring. How am I gonna be able to do this? We work together. We work together by focusing on benefits. Every time he spoke about a regulation, made sure that he spoke to the client why they would care, why does it matter, or why not doing it would get them in trouble. Anything that would get their attention. He worked on it and he wound up being so good at it that his boss said, okay, you're gonna be doing this all the time. And actually, I think you wanna turn this into a recruiting speech where you can talk to prospective clients and get them to sign on with us. He called me up at that point and he said, thank you for pushing me into doing the presentation to our current clients. I was scared at first, but uh, you're right. The more I did it, the easier it was. But now I have to recruit people. How do I do this? It turned out not to be terribly hard. Because we had worked so much on his regular speech and the benefits that people would get, he was able to convert his speech into a recruiting speech. He started getting clients for the company, and he is actually up for promotion right now called me the other day. The second thing that people get into trouble with is not staying on track. How do you avoid the tangents? How do you not go into the weeds of, uh, of what you're talking about? 
This is something that happens to many people. It's really easy to do. I mean, we're used to telling stories. I don't know if you've ever found yourself talking about something that you're supposed to be giving a presentation and you decide to expand on this point or you expand on another point and suddenly before you know it, you're off track. Or have you ever been in the situation where you're listening to somebody and they go off on a tangent and that's not what you came there to learn and, you st and that's really annoying. It wastes everybody's time. How can you keep yourself from doing that? Well, once again, reverse engineer your speech. Make sure you know what you're going to do and how long it's going to take you to tell that story, to, tell, to do these various speeches. You always want to make sure that you have time to get to your call to action. What is the thing you want them to do at the end of your speech? Never compress that and never compress the talking point that is the one that the most exciting talking point that's going to lead to your call to action. Whether it's talking within your company, talk, maybe you presenting to upper management or to the board saying, here's what we're doing. Here's what we want to do. Please approve it. You might be inspiring your team or maybe you're out there making a sales presentation all of this involves staying on track and knowing where you are going. Here is one of my favorite tips. If you think about the difference between a stopwatch and a countdown timer, many speakers, it, it, the thing about a stopwatch is you start it and it goes until you stop it. And that's what happens to so many speakers who will get up and they'll just start talking, not paying attention to the time, and they'll just go until they're done. Or they'll go until they run out of time and oops, they didn't get a chance to actually ask for the business or come to their conclusion. If you think of your speech as a countdown timer, say you know you have 20 minutes to present this material, Work out each of your talking points and figure out how long it's going to take them. Most importantly, since you never want to compress the end, time yourself, work, practice the pieces in reverse, time yourself, and then you know where you have to start your final, your final piece, your call to action, you're going to need to know how to do that so that you finish on time. And then if they want to talk to you later, if they want to talk to you more, that's fine. But make sure that you've made your point on time. I taught this to, uh, to a workshop that I'm doing for a biopharma company. And Nancy wrote back and said, she sent me a message. She said, thank you so much for the kitchen timer idea. I've been using that technique since your workshop series, and I'm getting much better results. My team is using the techniques too. And even the CFO, the chief financial officer has noticed the difference and he never notices anything. But what happens if you are having last minute doubts? Again, this is something that happens to everybody. At the last minute, we begin to think, oh, am I good enough? But maybe I don't have enough in this. This is what happened to my client, Sally. My client, Sally, has a niche uh, business where she in manufacturing where she manufactures replacement parts for very large machines. And she called me because she was going to do a six minute speech at a conference. And Sally is, she's very fun. She's interesting on stage. She loves what she does. So she's very compelling to watch, but she, she has a really hard time staying on time. We used the countdown timer for her and worked out a speech that was only six minutes long that made the points that wanted to make she rehearsed them. However, she fell into the trap 
the doubt trap. I called her up the night before she was going to give the presentation. And she said, I suddenly realized I need to add more information. What had happened was she began to think, oh dear, they're not gonna take me seriously. I, I'm a lone woman, I'm, I'm a woman in a man's uh, male dominated business manufacturing. People are gonna think I don't know what I'm doing. I'm gonna have to tell them some of the stories of the things that we do well. She wound up adding about 20 minutes of material to what was only going to be a six minute speech. Fortunately, I caught her in time. I urged her to trust her material. Trust your material. If you've worked it out, if you've gotten help from a, of a speaking coach and you know you've got a good speech, those doubts are just the voices in your head trying to sabotage you. Or maybe the voices in your head, maybe they're trying to keep you safe but it's, you're a grown up. You don't have to listen to them. Trust your material and do it as planned. And indeed, this is what happened with Sally. And she called me up afterwards and she said, it was awesome. I was able to finish within six minutes. I did the whole thing. And even better, three different companies came up to me afterwards. Representatives came up and they said, Wow, that was really compelling. We didn't know you did that. Let's set up a conversation to see how you can help us. So it worked for Sally. The third thing that's so important for engaging your listeners is stories and metaphors. I like to think of stories as a hook. How do you hook people's attention? This is especially important for beginnings and endings of a presentation, um, especially if you're doing a, a public speech, internal presentations, maybe not so much, but for a public speech, you want to have something compelling to get their attention. You're gonna have a hook such as telling a story, using a metaphor. Maybe sometimes you could use a quote, ask a question, Stories and metaphors work very well in the beginning of uh, in the beginning of a speech. They also work very well in the middle of a speech when you're giving information, giving the technical information, but then giving them a metaphor to make it to make it be a hook in the memory, to stay in the memory. The thing is that people remember stories more than they remember facts. Another technique that I like to use is to have a story or a quotation or some sort of final thought that will make people remember you. People remember the beginning, they'll remember the end. You can play around a bit in the middle. You wanna have a very strong beginning and a strong end. So a metaphor, a story, or something that will tell people why it's worth doing what you want them to do. Now, one of the feedback, one of the pushbacks I get from my clients all the time is, yes, but I'm speaking to scientists, or I'm speaking to engineers, or I'm speaking to experts. They're going to already know that. Even if you're speaking to your team and they already know that, stories and metaphors will still help because I don't care who they are. If they grew up as a human being, they grew up learning about the world through stories. The stories that we hear in our childhood are the ones that have us primed to learn stories and learn through stories. If you need to give technical information, then give the technical information and then use a metaphor to say, I like to think of it as this, or you can tell your clients how to do that. I, I work a lot with medical professionals and that's when I can say, you can explain this to your patients using this metaphor. 
And that has been very helpful. This was part of what we did with Sally with her six minute speech. One of the things that Sally did very well, she created a she created a new way to solve a problem for an oil refinery. In the process of refining oil, there is a strainer basket that the raw petroleum goes through that strains out all the solids so that just the liquid petroleum can go ahead and continue to be processed. Well, Sally's team had actually created a much better way of doing that. And that was the story that she chose to tell at her, uh, at the conference. But since it's, it's the sort of thing that you only know about it if you happen to work in that part of an oil refinery, and she knew that most of her audience wouldn't really understand, I said, why don't you use a metaphor? Say that it's like the hair trap in the shower. This strainer basket takes out all the icky stuff so that the liquid can follow through. Tally said, I can't talk about the hair trap in a shower, but I persuaded her to try it. And sure enough, one of the company reps who wanted to come in and discuss hiring her came up to her afterwards and said, I love that part about the shower drain and the hair trap. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'm going to think of it that way forever. So that metaphor really worked for Sally. So here's a good way to think about all of this. It's a process, not a patch. Instead of drowning people in data, think about what will they resonate with and what are the benefits, the benefits, the benefits. In terms of tangents, what will they resonate with Try to avoid going into the weeds. And what will they re resonate with? Avoid the tangents and use stories and metaphors to illustrate what you have to say. Basically, be interesting. This has been the the speakers who get results. If you're curious how your presentation skills are going, you can take our free quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And there in about four minutes, you can see where you're strong and where perhaps a little bit of support would get you the results you need and the recognition that you deserve. Now, I promised I would tell you about how to get the 17 keys, speaker keys to increase audience engagement. If you are interested in this, this is one of the benefits in the Visible and Valued Training Month. Send me an email at elizabeth at elizabethbachman.com and put the word 17 keys in the subject line and I'll be able to send you to the right place to get the full list. You still have to figure out how you're going to, how you're going to use it, but you will get the full list, which is something that I have up on my wall to remind me every time I want. Again, you have something important to say. You can use these techniques to be interesting so that your presentations have been spiced up and you become someone to follow, someone to hire, or someone to promote. This has been Elizabeth Bachman. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.